Welcome to another video for STAT 420. In this video, we're going to um, talk about how we estimate um, the linear regression parameters and thinking about um, the distribution of possible estimates that we can get when we're um, simulating or sampling um, from a bivariate distribution. Um, so before we get into this uh, topic more, um, I'd wanna kind of start with this visual uh, just um, thinking about both probability and inference and how they kind of um, fit in the, uh, a bit of a cycle. Um, so I'm going to start with the box here on the left. And think of this box here on the left as representing, um, I'm going to call it the truth. Um, you might also think of it as kind of parameters. Um, or kind of this like this true distribution. So right, so when we're thinking about, um, you know, working with um, uh, variables, um, there exist um, true distributions. There exist true parameters for the variables that we work with. Um, but unfortunately, when we're working in the real world, all we're going to have um, typically is a sample from, from that true distribution. So over here on the right, um, I'm going to draw a box, and I'm just going to call, uh, call it observed data. And I can also kind of put in here um, statistics, right? So what we're typically working with is a sample of observed data where we can calculate some statistics that we hope are reasonable estimates of these true parameters that exist. So whenever um, we're working um, with real data and we're starting up here on the right, uh, what we're trying to do is make estimates about what's actually in this box, right? So we have kind of a a revealing, right? So we have a sample from this box, and then we're trying to see, so based on what we saw here, based on this observed data, what could be true about this box? And when we're doing that, we're doing something called inference. And so the word inference means uh, drawing conclusions. Um, so I, th I tend to think of like a detective, where what we're doing is we have kind of the, these bits of evidence, we have these bits of data here. Um, and so we're trying to kind of piece together a picture of, so given this data, if this data is a random sample from this box, what could be in this box? What could be true? Um, however, we can also talk about going the other way here. And when we're going this way, um, we're technically working with probability. Um, and we're collecting data, or you might also say simulation. And this is a really helpful activity for us to do because um, it helps us understand, it helps us do inference better when we think about how we go the other way, where we start with um, this distribution. So in the case of, say, linear modeling, um, you know, we might have two variables. We, uh, we know that they have some kind of linear relationship, or at least we're assuming that they have some kind of linear relationship. Um, and we know that there exists some true bivariate distribution, right, that they, but this is the relationship between them, this is the amount of variability that is not explained by their relationship. Um, so we have a true beta naught, a true beta one, a true residual variance. Um, and then we can simulate a bivariate sample. Um, so we can simulate some x and y values um, that from that bivariate distribution. And then we can see how closely our own sample statistics kind of resemble the true parameters that they were being simulated from. So um, we're going to spend some time first talking about this process here. We're going to talk a little bit more about simulation. where We start with some parameters, and then we think about what could happen. We think about the distribution of possible sample statistics that we could get. Um, so the possible sample statistics that we could get exist within distributions. So there is a distribution of possible beta hat 1 values that I could get when I randomly sample um, from the true distribution. Um, and then if I take a sample of say 50 data points and I calculate a beta hat one, and then I take another sample of 50 data points and I calculate another beta hat one, they're not always gonna be the same. In fact, they're really never going to be quite the same. They're always gonna be a little bit different. But we know um, that if I did that enough, if I kept taking samples, I would begin to see a distribution of possible beta hat ones. And I'd begin to see kind of the shape that they make and I know that they should be centered around the, the true beta one parameter. So with that in mind, let's kind of go back here for a second and I'll 
get my picture out of the way. Um, right, so we talked about that there exists these true parameters, that there exists um, some random variable y, and it's going to have some relationship with this other variable x, such that if I plug in an x value, this is um, the equation that would tell me what each value of y would be, where there exists kind of this structured relationship as well as this random variation. Um, so just this idea that um, we're not talking about modeling variables with a perfect relationship. We're talking about modeling variables that have some but not a perfect relationship. So because of that, there's always going to be kind of this random um, noise element, epsilon. Um, and so uh, typically, if we're doing linear regression, we're assuming that um, the random noise is normally distributed around that true equation, that true line of best fit, um, and that the residuals are independent, and that they have a constant variance across the entire range in which that we're looking at. Um, so given those assumptions, that given these parameters exist in some um, equation that looks like this, we talked about the least squares method as one way that we can make a best estimate for what these parameters are given a sample of data. So given a sample of x and y um, pairs, um, we can calculate that our best estimate for beta hat 1 is going to be represented with this equation. For beta hat naught, it will be represented with this equation. And for estimating the residual standard deviation, it would be this equation. Uh, and so residual standard deviation, by the way, is an estimate for the um, sigma sub e. Um, so if I put a square on this, I would just take the square root off, and then I would put a square on this. Um, it doesn't really matter too much which of those two things I'm doing, uh, but just kind of a note that we go back and forth between the residual standard deviation versus the residual variance a lot, but you know they're kind of go hand in hand because one's just the squared version of the other. Okay, so we're not going to talk about how we derive this, um, but we do want to make clear that this is a thing. Um, that we know what the distribution of beta hat 1 should be. And so um, the distribution of beta hat naught and beta hat 1 are both going to be normally distributed. And it has to do with the fact that the least squares estimate for both are linear combinations of y sub i, and that each y sub i is normally distributed um, around the line of best fit. So what we mean by that is if I fit a, um, a linear regression um, with the assumptions that we made earlier, that at any given x point, there exists a distribution of possible y values that I could see that's going to be normally distributed about whatever the line of best fit is. And so if I go down here, maybe this is my x value and this is my where my line of best fit is, but there's going to exist a distribution of possible y values that I could see that's, again, normally distributed around the line of best fit. Um, so because I'm working with linear combinations of normally distributed variables, um, that means that the distribution of beta hat 1 and beta hat naught are also going to be normally distributed. Um, and so even though we're not going to derive why, um, in particular, the variance element comes out to this exact equation, we're just going to kind of state it and say that if you took an upper level class, um, you might be able to talk about how you derive this. Um, but for us, it's just good enough to say that this is what the distribution is, and we could use simulation to more or less verify that um, when we repeatedly sample um, from a bivariate distribution and calculate the beta hat ones and look at the distribution of beta hat ones, that this is the variance element that we observe when we simulate as well. Um, we could also simu uh, simplify this term um, to this. So, so if I don't want to write um, all of um, this denominator right here, I could just use the symbol s of x, x, which comes in handy when we're writing things. Um, I will take a second and just kind of talk about the logic of this variance element. So um, first off, um, beta hat 1 is centered at beta 1. So there, that is a normal distribution. So this is the distribution of possible beta hat 1s it's going to be centered at the true beta 1 value. And I probably should move my picture again. Um, so it's going to be centered at the true beta 1 value. 
Now, how much error, like how much variation I have in beta hat one is going to depend on kind of two terms here. The first is sigma squared and sigma squared in the numerator. So the larger sigma squared is, the more error I should expect in my beta hat one term. So in other words, sigma squared is representing again, um, the residual variance. Um, so if I put a little E on it, it might kind of help you identify what that means. Sometimes we don't put the E on, but I like to put the E on when I think about it. Um, and so this is saying that the more kind of unexplained variation there is between these two variables, the harder it is to estimate beta hat one with a sample. So if I have two samples of the same size, uh, but one's coming from a bivariate distribution with a lot less of the signal than the other one, then this one's gonna have a lot more possible error in my beta hat one estimate. Um, the denominator is a little bit trickier to kind of piece together, but uh, the, the logic here is that uh, the larger the range of X values that I have observed, um, the more accurate my beta hat one estimate is likely to be. So if you think about what that term is representing, is it's, is it's kind of measuring the variability in, um, in the X variable that I've observed. So the wider that range is going to be, the larger that denominator is going to get. And the larger that denominator gets, the smaller that variability term is going to become there and as, since it's in the denominator. Um, so if you think about it, if I observed X over only a very small range, um, it's going to be harder for me to get an accurate estimate of beta hat one. It's kind of like looking through like a very narrow, um, you know, narrow lens or a narrow window. Whereas if I have a much wider window, if I have a much wider range of X values, I'm going to get a much better estimate for beta hat one because I've observed it over a wider scale. This term is also indirectly measuring sample size too. So the larger the sample size I have, the larger that term is going to be as well since it's a summation. So again, that kind of comes through the more data I have, the less error I'm prone to have in my beta, uh, beta hat one estimate. The distribution of beta hat naught is relatively similar here. Again, it's gonna be normal distributed. Sorry, that's not the best normal distribution uh, curve I've ever uh, drawn. It's again gonna be centered at the parameter it's estimating beta naught. The variance term looks a little bit different. We still see a sigma squared. We still see an S of X to X in the denominator, uh, but there's um, a, a little bit more. There's another element. There's another N term there in the denominator. And there's also going to be an X bar squared in the numerator. Um, so the, the logic with the X bar squared is that it's kind of um, measuring um, how far away my X range is from X equals zero. So the, the more my data is centered around x equals zero, the better my estimate's going to be of the intercept. The farther my observed data tends to be from, the, from x equals zero, the more error I might have in my beta naught estimate. Um, so that may or may not make sense. I didn't draw a picture of that, but that's kind of the very brief description of why that term is there and the logic of that term. But again, we're not deriving it, it's not super important why it's exactly what it is um, as much as we're just going to be using this fact uh, moving forward.